pray that that is our heart. We consider the good things that God has done. We do not boast in our own righteousness, for it is nothing but rags. We boast in His. Amen. Well, uh, last Tuesday morning at about uh, 4 a.m., a car drove through the front window of a Chick-fil-A in Athens, Georgia. Uh, it wasn't a hate crime. It was uh, two teenagers decided to steal a car, go for a joyride. The cops were chasing them, and uh, I, I, I guess they thought, let's go to Chick-fil-A. Well, uh, <clears throat> they went right through the front window and, um, of course, closed down the restaurant. But uh, Chick-fil-A is... Uh, I think known for making uh, good out of bad uh, situations. And so the next day they, they did something that, that I just thought was hilarious. I wanted to share it uh, with you this morning. Nobody was hurt. 4 a.m. I think they have one employee in there starting to get things ready. Uh, but they uh, boarded up the big hole in the wall uh, and they had their cow out there to kind of help direct people. I want to show you, keep put up that first picture. I want to show you... Uh, uh, the uh, first thing that they did, <coughs> yeah, cars this way, not that way. I mean, it's just smart, right? Uh, but, you know, these cows, they're, they're busy fellows. So at some point, he, he had to do more than just uh, hold signs. So he taped up a sign. He got to work. Uh, show the, the next picture. He's out there with a broom. He's trying to clean up, you know, all the debris and uh, just uh, pointing people which way that they need to go. I just... I thought, you know, that's a devoted cow. You know, they are not going to let a, cow, a, a car going through the front window keep them from their goal of getting us to eat more chicken. They're just, they're not going to let anything stop them. Uh, and they know how to <laughs> take a bad thing and turn it into uh, something good. And, and uh, so I, it was encouraging to me. And, and as, we, as I was preparing for this morning's sermon, um, I was thinking about that. You know, life is made up of bad things. There's just bad things that happen. But oftentimes, uh, how bad it is depends on how we respond to it. I mean, just in and of itself, there's bad things. But how we respond to those things oftentimes determines how bad they are or how good they can be. And so this morning, we're going to talk about how do you respond when bad things happen, and also how do you respond when good things happen. And we're going to see as we continue looking at the life of Hezekiah uh, in Isaiah 38, we're going to see that whether it's good or it's bad, whatever you're facing in life, the greatest thing you can do is to remember our God and who He is. Uh, let's go ahead and pray uh, before we dive into the Word and ask God to speak to us. Please bow your heads with me. Lord God, we thank you that it is not because of who we are. It is not because of what we have done. But that we can uh, approach the very throne of Almighty God because of who Jesus is and what he has done on our behalf. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace that you have shown us in, in, in coming to rescue sinners like us. And I pray that this morning our hearts would joyfully respond to you with faith. Lord, as we turn to your word, we are in desperate need of living water, of living bread, of your words that bestow life. And so we ask for you to speak in a powerful way to us to convict us of our sins and of your righteousness and to stir within our hearts a deeper, greater faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, here we are, and we pray that you would grant us ears that would hear and eyes that would see and hearts that would believe. Here we are, Lord God. I pray that you would mold us and make us to be more like Jesus. Let this time be for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Isaiah chapter 38, we're going to be covering 38 and 39 uh, this morning. And uh, just to remind us of where we are, we've entered into this narrative section in Isaiah's prophecy where he's going to give us the storyline of, of everything that his prophecies have been leading up to and addressing up to this point in time King Hezekiah, a godly king who had been seeking to restore the worship of the one true God in Judah, 
tearing down the false altars, making sure people would worship God in the temple, uh, getting the, the priest all organized again, providing for the sacrifices, just going above and beyond to try to get the people's hearts back to God. And yet, even this godly king had some bad decisions that he had made in turning to Egypt when Assyria was coming down and threatening them. And we saw last week the consequences of sin, that sin always brings death. It doesn't matter what you think about your sin and how little you may think of it, sin always brings death. Even those decisions we make that seem logical on the outside, if it's against what God has told us to do, it will blow up in our face in the end. And this is what happened is Hezekiah has Assyria surrounding Jerusalem. But in that moment, Hezekiah turned to God in faith and he cried out to the Lord. He laid it all down before God. He said, I'm not going to turn anywhere else. You alone are our hope. You alone are our salvation. Lord God, glorify your name through the deliverance of your people. And God says, okay, I'll do that. And he steps into history and does what only God can do and strikes down the Assyrian army and causes them to leave Jerusalem and Judah and to leave the remnant intact. Well, during all of this situation, there's been something going on, I think, in, in personally in Hezekiah's life uh, that sheds an even greater light on Hezekiah's faith journey. Either while the Assyrian threat is there or immediately after Hezekiah gets sick. And in this very, very negative time of illness for Hezekiah, we see how Hezekiah remembers his God and the result of that. So I invite you to read with me starting in verse 1 of chapter 38. He says, In those days, speaking of the days of the Assyrian threat or immediately thereafter, in those days Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly, literally wept with a great weeping. Then the Lord came, then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will cause the shadow on the stairway which has gone down with the sun on the stairway of Ahaz to go back 10 steps. So the sun's shadow went back 10 steps on the stairway on which it had gone. Now skip over to verse 21. Now Isaiah had said, Let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Then Hezekiah had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Now both Second Kings and Second Chronicles details this event in Hezekiah's life. And so when you have one event that's given in three different locations, it's usually a pretty important event in the scriptures. This illness that came upon Hezekiah, we don't know why. We don't know if it was because of his sin, if it was just um, because of God's uh, testing of Hezekiah. We don't know what, exactly what brought on this illness. But Hezekiah is told by Isaiah, get your house in order, you're going to die. This illness is not going to be healed. You and I, when we pray about those who are sick or, or even ourselves, we always have this hope of healing. But if you give in to that thought of there is no healing, then desperation and just despair can kind of creep in. And this is what happens with Hezekiah. He's told there is no hope. There is no healing. You will die. And Hezekiah, he turns to the wall and he begins to weep greatly and to cry out to God and say, God, remember me. I think at this point, Hezekiah has probably already repented of his sin to turn to Egypt. And he's crying out to God saying, remember me. Remember what all I have done and how I have acted faithfully in trying to bring your people back to worshiping you as you have directed. Remember me. If you go and you look in First King or Second Kings and the, the detailing of Hezekiah's reforms in Second Chronicles, I mean, he was a godly guy. He did what 
hardly any other king ever did in Israel's history. And his devotion to the Lord cannot be questioned. But here he is living a life as faithfully as he can. And he's going to die early, young. Remember me, God. Now, the scriptures don't give a moral conclusion about the selfishness of his prayer. I mean, he's not saying glorify yourself. He's not saying, I, like David, I, then, you know, heal me and then I can go and teach people your ways. He's simply saying, remember what I've done. Don't let this be my end. But the very fact that God accepts it and that God responds to it is likely an indication that Hezekiah's prayer is not that bad. I mean, after all, if you have a heart of faith and your faith is in the Lord God who has promised to care for his people and promised specifically in Hezekiah's situation to deliver the king and Jerusalem, and now the king's going to die, what's going to happen to the city if the king dies? I mean, Hezekiah has a lot of reason to call God's attention to these things. When we as his people call out to God saying, remember us, your people, we if we have the right heart, are calling out to God, saying, remember your promises to your people. God is glorified when he cares for his people. But he's calling God to remember him, and we're going to see in just a second that he does this, not because of who he is, not because of what he has done, but because of what he remembers about who God is. But before we get that, um, God, he sends Isaiah to him. He says, okay, I'll give you 15 years. Here's a sign for you. It's a supernatural sign. I don't know why the shadows went back. I don't know God, if God just played with the light, if he actually moved the earth, if he, what he did. But it's a supernatural sign to show that it's a supernatural act that heals Hezekiah. So the cake of figs on the boil is not necessarily what heals him. It's the medium maybe that God uses to heal him. But God is making sure that Hezekiah and that Isaiah and that Judah and that you and I know it's God Almighty who saves the life of the king. And so God's going to be glorified as he gives this supernatural sign. Now, there's all sorts of things we can talk about. And, and, and I encourage you to go read 2 Kings, Second Chronicles for a lot of reasons, but particularly to fill in some of the gaps uh, for Hezekiah's story. But I want to spend most of our time this morning in Hezekiah's poem that he wrote, his psalm that he wrote, starting in verse 9, because this gives insight into the heart and the mind of the king as he faces a very bad situation in his life. Verse 9, if you'll read along with me, says, A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said in the middle of my life, I am to enter the gates of Sheol. I am to be deprived of the rest of my years. I said, I will not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I will look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. Like a shepherd's tent, my dwelling is pulled up and removed from me. As a weaver, I rolled up my life, and he cuts off from the loom. From night until day, you make an end of me. I composed my soul until morning. Like a lion, so he breaks all my bones. From day until night, you make an end of me. Like a swallow, like a crane, so I twitter, I moan like a dove. My eyes look wistfully to the heights. Oh Lord, I am oppressed. Be my security. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me. He himself has done it. I will wander about all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live. And all these things is the life of my spirit. O oh, restore me to health and let me live. Lo, for my own welfare I had great bitterness. It is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. It is the living who give thanks to you, as I do today. A father tells his sons about your faithfulness. The Lord will surely save me. So we will play my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life at the house of the Lord. As a guy begins his psalm by talking about the gates of Sheol and ends his psalm by talking about the house of the Lord. 
How do we get from the gates of Sheol to the house of the Lord? How do we get to the threshold of death all the way to the place in which life exists in the presence of God? He begins uh, by sharing what his heart was as he looked at this illness saying that I'm going to die in the middle of my life. He says, I'm not going to see the Lord. I'm not going to see people. I'm going to be, uh, my tent's going to be ripped up. But there's something I want to point out to you in verse 12. He says, as a weaver, I rolled up my life. Meaning, as a weaver, I'm doing my job. I'm, I'm getting my life in order. I'm setting it all as I want it to, to be. And, and, uh, and then God comes in and he just cuts me off at the loom. In other words, Hezekiah is blaming God for his illness. Saying, I have structured my life and lived my life to get to where I am. And in the middle of my journey, God comes and just cuts me off. He is the one, uh, day until night, making an end of me. Verse 13, I composed my soul. Uh, translations say it a little bit differently. NIV says, waited patiently. ESV says, I calmed myself. The Hebrew literally means I smoothed my soul, or smoothed myself. We don't know exactly what it means, but it probably is an indication that, I, that Hezekiah is saying that, that I tried my best to take care of the issue. I tried to be at peace. I tried to be okay. But like a lion, so he breaks all my bones. From day until night, you make an end to me. He says, I tried, Lord. First of all, I've lived my life, and now you're cutting me off in the middle. And second of all, in the midst of this pain, I've tried to take care of myself. I've tried to be emotionally okay. And you continue to come after me like a lion. You make an end of me, day and night. Now we can look at this and say, wow, Isaiah's having, uh, his guy's having a little bit of a crisis of faith. I mean... He's blaming God for his illness. We shouldn't blame God for our, the bad things in our lives, right? I don't think God minds getting credit where credit is due. Hezekiah is not wrong about this. The illness is from God because all things are from God. God does not create evil. He does not do evil. He does not tempt people to sin. But there is nothing that can happen in the entire universe unless the Lord God either allows it or does it. He is in complete and total control of our lives and has complete say over when we live and when we die. Hezekiah is not wrong by saying, God, you're the one afflicting me. Just like Job wasn't wrong to say, God, you're the one afflicting me. But Hezekiah doesn't stop where most people do in this situation. Most people will blame God. It's God's fault. I don't believe in God, but it's his fault somehow. They'll blame God for the bad things that are happening. Hezekiah doesn't do that. He remembers, God, you're the one in control. God, you're the one who has done this to me. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Verse 14, be my security. He begins to pray to the sovereign God, to the one who has afflicted him, to be the one who heals him. Because he realizes that God is the only one who can do it. He remembers not just that God is sovereign and allowed or brought on this sickness, but that God is also sovereign and is the one who can heal him of the sickness. So he begins to pray out, cry out to God, uh, O Lord, by these Things men live, and all these things is the life of my spirit. Verse 16, oh, restore me to health. Let me live. And here I think, verse 17, we have the key. For my welfare, I had great bitterness. It is you who have kept my soul, literally loved my soul from the pit of nothing. You have cast all my sins behind your back. In other words, God, you've forgiven me. I remember not just that you're the sovereign maker of heaven and earth. I remember not just that you're the only one who can be my security, who can heal me. Egypt can't do it. They've obviously failed. I can't do it. I've obviously failed. You're the only one who can be my security. But now, God, I also remember you're the one who has forgiven me. Christian, this is one of the most beautiful truths to remember whenever you experience a trial or hardship in your life. Sickness comes or or whatever the distress might be, is that God has loved you enough to forgive you of your sin. 
And listen to me, if God has loved you enough to forgive you of your sins, if God has loved you enough to send Jesus to die in your place so that you could be redeemed and made His, do you really think that God is going to drop the ball when some little bad thing comes along your way? We forget who our God is in the bad. Hezekiah says, I remember who you are. I remember what you have done, and so I plead, God, that you will do what you have promised to do. And this is what Hezekiah uh, commits himself to do. He says, um, in the, it's in the land, it, says, it is the living, verse 19, who give thanks to you as I do today. A father tells his son about your faithfulness. The Lord will surely save me, so we will play my songs on stringed instruments. In other words, God... I remember who you are. I remember your power. I remember your sovereignty. And I remember your grace. And so, God, I'm clinging to you, and I will praise you all my days. Puts his somewhat selfish prayer a little bit in perspective. He says, God, remember me of what all I've done. But, but Lord, I'm only crying out to you because I remember you and what all you have done. So save me that I might... Praise you. In the bad, his guy remembered who God is and what he can do. He doesn't downplay God's role in the sickness. He says, you said it. What more can I say? You're the one who said, I'm going to die. I have nothing. If you're the one who says, I'm going to live, what can I say? I mean, who are we to question God? Who are we to fight against God's word and say, no, God, that's not the way it should be. When bad things come along our ways, we tend to say, this isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't fair. I shouldn't have to deal with this. I shouldn't have to experience this. This is not the way. Who are you to say to God who has decreed these things, you're wrong. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. As a guy says, who am I to speak against God? You're the one who's decreed these things. He doesn't downplay God's role. And he sur simply surrenders to God's sovereignty. But here's the thing. God is still good. Yes, God does not create evil. He does not do evil. He does not tempt people to sin. But God does sometimes allow and sometimes even cause bad things to happen in our lives. But even in the midst of those times of punishment or discipline, our God is still a good, good God. Discipline's never pleasant. It's never a happy moment when God has to get the rod out and go to town on us. But he's still a good God while he does it. That never ends. God doesn't change in the bad. What changes in the bad is our memory. We forget who our God is. And so often people turn upon him. We say things, life's not good right now. I just don't have time for God. I mean, bills aren't going to pay themselves. I've got to work. I've got to earn. I've got to do this. It, you know, my life is falling apart. If I don't do this, it's, it's just going to all fall apart. And so God's got to wait right now. We put God on hold. We forget about him. Well, listen to me, if you're going through a hardship, whether it's your, your finances, your marriage, your family, your health, you're going through a hardship, there's nobody else who deserves your time more than God because there's nobody else who can take care of you better than God. Don't forget God in your bad. Or maybe it's not, well, I don't have time for God. Maybe it's simply, I don't trust God. I don't like what he's doing here. I don't agree with what he's doing here, and I don't want to have anything to do with him if he's the one who has done this to me. First of all, remember that oftentimes we're our own worst enemies and we're the cause of our own bad. But second of all, remember that bad or good, God is good all the time. And as they like to say all the time, God is good. Do we believe that? Do we forget that? Don't forget. Remember God in the bad. Now here's the thing. We say, all right, preacher, remember God in the bad, I'm sick, I'm going to die, but uh, I'm going to remember that God is good, or, or yeah, I'm going to lose my home, but God is good. Okay, I can do that, I can do that, I can trust in God. Well, that's a hard thing to do, but I think there's sometimes something that's even more difficult to do. 
And that's remembering God in the good. Let's look at verse 39. Okay, so Hezekiah has just been saved from Assyria. He's been healed from this illness that should lead to death. Chapter 39 uh, of Isaiah, verse 1, it says, At that time, he's been healed, so at that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all his treasure house and the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and his whole armory and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say and where have they come from to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. So, well, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They've seen all that's in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. And as Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that's in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, There will be peace and truth in my days. Again, we have this story in Kings and Chronicles. Chronicles gives us actually a, kind of a evaluation of this situation and we know from chronicles that hezekiah sins in this situation so the king of babylon sends to hezekiah he says i heard you were sick you got better chronicles says that he was wanting uh, that he sent to, to hezekiah to find out about the wonders of what had happened i mean assyria had destroyed judah surrounded jerusalem 180,000 assyrians are wiped out overnight by God, and then they leave, and then Hezekiah is dying, but now he's better. I want to know what's going on. So the king of Babylon sends to find out about these wonders, but I think there was something a little more devious behind these envoys and their coming. See, at this time in history, Babylon was really the only contender for power with Assyria. In fact, they had won a very large battle against Assyria, showing that they had some power behind them. But Assyria was still the big dog, and Babylon needed some uh, treaties and partnerships to help them. So what I think was happening is that he was sending to what at that point was the most powerful nation in that region, to Judah and to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was all too happy to say, not only will I help you with this, but let me show you just how much I can help. And he begins with, political pride of boasting of all that he has and shows them his armory and shows them his treasuries and says, this is how much Judah can help. We're not just some little measly uh, pawn that you're going to use. Uh, we can be a real partner in this battle against Assyria. And if that's the case, which the, the scriptures seem to indicate that, uh, that Hezekiah's heart was very wrong in this, if that's the case, then Hezekiah was doing what his son Ahaz, or what his father Ahaz had done with Assyria. When Ahaz said, well, I'll partner up with Assyria and, and I'll be their partner and we'll, we'll help take care of these uh, other nations that are around us. It didn't work out very well for Ahaz. It's not going to work out very well for Hezekiah. It says in Second Chronicles 32, uh, this is the evaluation. It says, even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon who sent t uh, to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him, that is Hezekiah, that he, God, might know all that was in his heart. But Hezekiah, he gave no return for the benefit he received, talking about his healing, because his heart was proud. Therefore wrath came on him and on Judah and on Jerusalem. However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. In other words, the Bible says Hezekiah was proud and he sinned with these envoys. God allowed them to go, allowed Hezekiah to receive them to see what was in Hezekiah's heart. Hezekiah had received healing from God, deliverance from Assyria, 
and then just like completely forgot all about it the next day. And so Isaiah comes and he says, well, I'm glad you showed them everything because they're going to be taking everything away very soon. And your sons are going to go off and be in the palace there in Babylon. They're not going to be here in your throne because you're not going to have a throne. And Isaiah predicts the exile of Judah into Babylon that's going to take place about 115 years later. And here's the weirdest thing about this whole thing. Hezekiah says, the word of the Lord is good. For he thought, I'm going to have peace in life in my days. This is how he responds to being told that his descendants are going to be taken off, that his people are going to be exiled. Listen, exile was not a pleasant thing for nations. There was a lot of death and a lot of destruction. And Hezekiah responded by saying, well, it's good. Remember what he said back in chapter 38? Uh, he said in verse, uh, uh, I'm missing it, verse 18, or not 18, verse uh, 15, he says, What shall I say? For he who has spoken to me, he himself has done it. I wander about all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in these things the life of the Spirit. Restore to me health. Let me live. He's crying out for his own life. Lo, my own welfare, I had great bitterness. It is you who have kept my soul from the pit and nothingness. You cast all my sins behind your back. He says that, that what God has declared has become bitterness for him, and he's pleading with God. You've declared death for me. Don't do this. You've forgiven me. Love me. Save me. When it's bad news for Hezekiah, it's bitterness for Hezekiah. When it's bad news for his sons, maybe he didn't like his sons. I don't know, but he, <laughs> he doesn't care. Because it doesn't matter. Pride in his heart welled up so fast that you have God healing him from death, and then he forgets God almost immediately. Listen to this. Health, wealth, and prosperity kills. If we forget the one who gives those things to us. This morning while I was praying, I was going to talk about this, but I actually have a, a real example of this. I was praying, and, and I got up from praying, and my back just twisted. And it was standing like this, and it's like, I can't, I can't straighten up. I couldn't stand up. I kept falling <laughs> over. It probably looked kind of comedic if my wife didn't know I was in such pain. But when my back doesn't hurt, I don't think a thing about it. Here's the thing, I've got a herniated disc and bulging disc. I've got all those problems in my back. But when there's no pain, when it's not bad, I don't think a thing about it. I don't think, you know, I need to exercise to make sure everything's strong. Or, you know, I need to not pick up that big heavy box and, and show off my, my manpower. I need, to, I need to let somebody else do that, call a deacon to come do that for me. I, you know, I don't think about those things when there's no problem. Now, the problem doesn't go away. But when things are good, I just kind of forget about it. We all in this room have a problem in our hearts. And when life is good, we tend to forget that we are not good. That we are sinners, that we are broken, that we are completely and totally dependent on God. And when we turn against God or choose to go our own way, death will follow quickly. It's hard to remember God in the bad. But I would say sometimes it's harder to remember God in the good. Listen to me, riches, wealth, there's nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with being a rich person there's nothing wrong with being a poor person there's nothing wrong with being healthy these are all just features of life and your station in life whether you're rich or poor whether you're short or tall whether you're beautiful or ugly all of those things don't really matter all of those things are just off in the distance what matters is what you do with Jesus. 
because rich or poor, healthy or sick, we will all stand before God one day. And we will all give an account for our lives one day. And if it is not for His grace, and if it is not for faith in Jesus Christ, we will all pay for our sins for all of eternity. Good comes. Praise the Lord for it, but do not forget the one who gives it. I'm going to read to you Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. It says, two things I ask of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. That I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Forget you in the good. Or that I not be in want and still and profane the name of my God. Life is made up of good and of bad. You're not going to be able to always have good. You're not going to be able to always escape the bad. The question is, what are you going to do when you're confronted with the good? What are you going to do when you're confronted with the bad? Are you going to forget God? Your marriage begins to collapse and you forget God? Or maybe your marriage is going so well that you don't need God. You don't have money for the bills that are coming in because you got laid off or you just don't make enough money. Are you going to forget God and say, I just don't have time for him? Or maybe you got so much money that you can just throw it away. Well, who needs God if you got all that you need? Good or bad, it doesn't matter. We're all going to be faced with it. But what are you going to do with God in the good? What are you going to do with God in the bad if you forget him? Then you've turned your back on the one who has given you all the good things you enjoy. And you've turned your back on the one who is able to deliver you from all the bad. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this reminder through Hezekiah's life. I thank you, Lord, for Hezekiah's testimony of faith, that he repented even after his pride. For we are not perfect, and we are all fallen, and we are all broken, but you are good and pure and holy. We thank you for offering salvation to us freely, for paying the price through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Lord, I thank you for allowing me the privilege, the honor, and the undeserved gift of being called yours. Help us to not forget. Help us to remember you, who you are, what you have promised, what you have done. Whether it's good or bad that we face in this life, Lord, help us to face each thing, each moment, each event, each situation in faith in you. For apart from you, we are nothing and can withstand nothing. But if God is for us, who can stand against us? Lord God, please give us hearts of faith that cling to you in the good and in the bad. That you might be glorified whether our life is bad or good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning as we respond... What stage of life are you in right now? All of us, we come here, we have different burdens. Some of us, uh, life's good. Some of us, life is not so good. We have church members uh, who are sick. We have those who are looking at death even. We have people who are struggling with their bills, struggling with their finances, struggling with their jobs, struggling with their marriages and their relationships and their family. I mean, maybe for you, this is a bad time of life hard time of life. Where is God in the bad? And I don't mean where is he, like literally where is he. I mean where is he in your heart, in your mind, and in your plans. If you forsake God or you forget God, then you forsake and forget the God who gives good things. And so if you're finding yourself in a bad time of life right now, turn to the Lord. God has already, like I said, he's already done the big job for us. He's 
paid for our sins through Jesus crucified. He has won eternal life through Jesus resurrected. He's already done the heavy lifting for us. And if he was willing to do that for you, if he was willing to cast your sins behind his back, don't you think he's going to be willing to take care of whatever bad thing, however big or small it may be, you're going through right now? Don't forget who God is. Remember. Maybe for you, life is good. Business is flourishing. Life is not kicked you out of the house. Kids actually love you. Life is just good. Oh, it's so easy to forget God and prosperity. One of the big failures of our nation. Prosperity kills. And we forget the one who gives it. So if life's good for you, praise God. I mean you, praise God. Give God the glory for it. Don't forget he's the one who did. My invitation to each and every one of us is that we pray that God would cleanse us from the forgetfulness that so often takes us away from him. Please stand with me and let's sing.